great. I'm tech, people. Yeah, no, I wasn't a big fan of, uh, of 
greatest American hero. But he did a, an album called Secret Smiles. And I had that album, and it was fantastic. It still holds up today. It was a pop album. It was when, obviously, he was kind of, you know, uh, getting, he was being marketed as a teen beats, good-looking young uh, male. But he, he, he created this album, and there's some wonderful songs on it, and it was intelligent, and it wasn't stupid, and I got to thank him for it back in the, in the green room. And anyway, man, it's one of the reasons why I'm here as, as a fan, because I'm not just here as you know, Major Davis and all that stuff, you know. I'm, I'm here as a fan, so I get to, I get to, I get to hang out and meet these folks too. It's great. It's great being a fan. Don't ever stop being a fan. I think when we stop being in awe of something, we, we, we stop becoming a fan of something, you just begin to die. You, you become, I don't know, maybe your cup's a little bit too full. You become complacent, you become contemptuous, and you should always have that spark. At least I hope I never lose it when I when I meet a celebrity or I see somebody. It's like, well, it's Adam Savage, man. I'm and I hope to God I never I never lose that. I really, really don't. Sometimes it's not good to meet your heroes. I've met a few of my heroes. And I'm like, damn, I wish I hadn't done that. Because <laughs> then you find out that they're just people, and I don't I don't want to know that my heroes are people. I don't want to see someone that I grew up watching or I watched their movies over and over and over again and I would aspire to come anywhere close to their contribution to me creatively and it's very difficult for me to see them sitting alone behind a bingo table. It really is. So. Sometimes I don't want to meet them. I want to keep them in that that room of gold that, that where, I, where I keep my most precious memories. Because sometimes you're not having a good time. You're low in your life. You're depressed. The girlfriend broke up with you. Going through school is sometimes it's hard. You're being made fun of. You're picked on. But there's that piece of music that you keep listening to that keeps you going. Or there's a show. Or there's a character. There's something that you identify with. And it keeps you going. So it's it's a trip when I meet some of these people. It's just like, wow, you know. The myth and the, and the reality. It's a trip, it really is. Anyway, hi everybody, I'm gonna shut up for a second. Who's, who's the first con? Who's, who's the first, first convention? Any first timers? Welcome. Welcome, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so funny, forever, I used to hear, oh yeah, go to the conventions like they're crazy and they're, they're nuts. And then I finally went to my first convention. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> totally. But in a great way. It went from being these, you guys are a bunch of weirdos, to you guys are a bunch of weirdos, man. And I, I love it, so I feel, uh, I feel a, a kinship to, uh, to the oddballs and the odd men out, men and women, of course. Because um, I know that, that down deep, uh, many of you are artists, and you're all creatives, and you have imaginations that uh, that I just think are accelerated or concentrated versus I don't know, maybe versus the the quarterback of the high school football team. I just, I just. I don't know, I just appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you again for, for being here. So, I don't know, what are we gonna talk about? What do you guys wanna talk about? Who's bored out of their nut already? Thinking, why the hell did I sit here? I don't know who this guy is, I never saw any of his shows. He comes in here with all his energy and he's really starting to annoy me. He looks like Polly Shore and I don't know what the hell's going on. I do not know. I get that. I swear. Look, I did. No, I think I kind of do look like Polly Shore. If you look at, like, when I was 30, and somebody said, God, you look like Polly Shore. And I'm like, what? I look like Polly Shore? And he had a movie out called In the Army Now. 
if you look at the poster, it's me! It's so me! I'm like, oh my god. And a, a guy, he was drunk, he had a few beers, and I swear to God, strike me dead. I was at a bar, or wherever that was, at Sagebrush Cantina in Calabasas, California. And I remember, because a guy came up to me, and he was with a girl. And he's like, Polly, man, so great to see you again, man. And I could tell that he knew me. But I'm, I'm not Polly Shore, right? And he, like, he was so certain. And I, I remember thinking I didn't want to embarrass him in front of this girl he was with. So I played alone. <laughs> I did. I didn't tell him that I wasn't. I just, oh yeah, man, yeah. And he was talking about yeah, with me and you. And I think he even mentioned Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. This is me, you, and Billy were hanging around. I'm like, yeah, it was good times, man. It was great. But I guess he impressed his girl and maybe he got a kiss at the end of the night, I don't know. <laughs> Alright, I'm just curious, I, I, out of the, the demographic that's here, how many uh, of you folks know me from Falling Skies? Cool. Stargate. Woo! Oh! Man, ain't that the kicker? A uh, preacher. Couple. Blood drive. One. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm always tripped out. Like, I was so blessed to work five years with Steven Spielberg. I mean, wow! But it's that damn starting. <laughs> no, and I love it, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, but it was this global phenomenon, and God, am I so happy that I got to work on that show. Uh, I'll tell you, this may sound, how do I put this? No, I'm going to tell you a story. I'll tell you two stories. Uh, yeah, two stories. And they're both really cool. They're for me. I don't know how well they'll be for you. But uh, I remember being, and this is going to sound arrogant, because it's not, I'm so grateful to work. But I was working on a, what the hell was the show called? I was in Lithuania, Vilnius, Lithuania, working on a TV show. And, uh, and I was so happy, oh my god, I'm working. And I remember going home to my hotel room, if you want to call it that, it was, it was an interesting place. But I flipped on the television, and there was me as Major Davis on Stargate SG-1 speaking German. <laughs> and I'd never seen myself speaking German. And I just realized, like, this show was so popular that they hired a German guy to do my voice. And I'm sure you had to listen to it and listen to the cadence and, and the, 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 the register of it. And he did it in, in German. And I thought, that's cool. Like, that's just cool. You're an actor. You, you work on a show. And then you see yourself on a television in Lithuania, and it's, you speak in German. And it's, it's just these little moments, you just scratch your head. And it's like, God, this is so much better than waiting tables at Denny's. Because <laughs> I did that too, man, and I was happy to do it, you know? Uh, second story. <laughs> And I, I still think of this. It was uh, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, I don't know when it was, maybe. I don't know when it was. But I remember I didn't have a girlfriend, so I, it wasn't a happy Christmas. I was, it was one of those depressed Christmases. I was super depressed. I was naturally with family. I was in Las Vegas. We were visiting my sister. And I'm going nuts in the house. I gotta get out of got no girlfriend, I got nowhere to go, there's no party, there's no nothing, it's quiet at the house because we don't drink or anything. And so I thought, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just miserable, I, I gotta go for a drive. So I went to drive, and I went to here, the next thing I know, I'm actually at a, a bar, a sports bar. And you walk in, and there's like three people in it. The two, there's you and the two other losers at the bar, because they got nothing else going on on New Year's Eve, right? And I remember just being, just, Depressed. I was just depressed, man. I just was. Life sucks. Got no girlfriend. Everything's crap. And I'm not working or whatever the hell it was. I'm just not feeling very happy.
happy. And I look up, and there's like five televisions, and I'm on three of the five televisions. I swear to God. I swear to God. And I look up, and I'm on three of the five TVs. Two of them were a star, two, two different Stargate episodes, and something else was X Files or something. And I just, and I wanted to go. But then I thought, if I say anything, it'll only, only make me look like a bigger loser. You know, that, that's me up there on the TV there, you know? And I, it was just surreal. Absolutely surreal. Here you, you, you think you're down. You think you're bummed out, you're not having a good day, and legitimately so, that's life, right? It goes up and down, no matter whether you're living in a mansion or, or, a, or in a car. You know, you can have good days and bad days, but I just thought to myself, holy crap, catch yourself on. You got nothing to worry about. And there you are, three televisions, man. So it was just uh, weird, just weird. This business, this career, this pursuit, and how it can some come around, come around behind you and you're having, because like I'm just having a normal life. Just like you guys are having a normal life. Only add to that, you're at Walmart and you see yourself on one of the display televisions. It's just weird. It's just friggin' weird. And there's no, I don't even, it's anecdotal, I don't even know what it means, I, other than to say that, uh, <laughs> it's pretty awesome, dude, you know? It's pretty awesome. I don't know, I don't know what else to say, just to kind of break the ice. Um, Are you guys? Are you guys like waiting for Alan Richardson because he's next? <laughs> yes, sir. Why was I never promoted? Yeah, that's. Eight seasons, you were still. I'm gonna say. I'm gonna tell you why. I think it's because I never learned anybody's name. No, like what I mean by that. Look, my first time I auditioned for Stargate like a hundred times. One time, at least, at least eight before I got the part of Major Davis. I auditioned for Daniel Jackson. But um, I never thought I'd ever, when I got the first job, that I worked my first day, I never thought I'd ever be invited back. So I just, I, I, you're there, I was so focused on the script, so focused on doing a good job. I was happy because there was Don, and I knew Don from other shows, and I was kind of a young, new actor in Vancouver, and Don said, he took me under his wing and said, Don, man, I'll, 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 I got you back. And so I was proud to be there, and I had a lot going on in my mind. So, and I knew I'd be gone tomorrow. And so I didn't learn anybody's name, because there's a lot of people. There's the grip and the continuity, and there's the sound person, and there's, there's lots of people there. Anyway, so then, sure enough, I'm invited back, another episode, about so many months later. And I thought, wow, this is going to be the last time. I'm never here tw twice, you know what I mean? And I still never learned anybody. This went on for 10 years. I swear to God, it was finally 10 years later, I thought, man, you better start knowing somebody's name. Now that's probably not the reason why he never technically got promoted, but uh, but I, I call that karma. I should have learned the damn craft service person's name, then I would have been promoted. So that's what I say. About it. Yes. Did anything ever come of drawing dead? I was going to say, forgive me, because I've worked on a couple of shows that have changed their titles. Drawing dead. Thank you. Wasn't who was the other actor that was supposed to be in that? Gary Graham. That's right, Gary Graham, of course. And then we were also trying to get uh, Doug Jones for that. Anyway, yeah, it went. Uh, it, it it went where. Good intentions and blood, sweat, and tears, and tons of labor often go, which is down the hole. 
but it goes down the hole with a seed. And that seed grows in a little sapling. And one day that sapling grows into a giant tree! And we can all pluck from the fruit. Uh, I don't know if that's happened yet, but, uh, but, but that's what happened to that project. In fact, it's funny, speaking of, look, I've got a project that I'm working on right now. And I, I'm not sure if any of you, oh God, please come on Friday. This is what I'm doing right now, you guys, and I won't forget your question, thank you. Um, about 10 years ago, I made a proof of concept called Centigrade. It was basically about a, a man who lives in an old busted up camper trailer. There's no wheels on it, he's laying dead in the weeds, and he does a bad thing, and he wakes up the next morning and it's rolling down the highway. And the doors won't open, and the windows won't break, and he's burning up. And it was a proof of concept that I, I directed, I wrote and I directed, and as part of it, uh, for a television show and or a feature, we marketed the film, we put it into some film festivals, and we ended up making the shortlist for an Academy Award nomination. In a, in a, to make a long story short, it's a pretty good movie. It's only 16 minutes long, and we're screening it here at FanX, Friday at 6 o'clock. I'd love you all to come. I would love you all to come. For real. So, what we're doing with it is, for the longest time, for 10 years, I wanted to make this movie. MGM ended up picking it up as a TV show. And we were going down that route. And then MGM had some financial restructuring, and the entire project was shelved. Didn't happen. We were going to do it again, and I booked uh, a little show called Falling Skies. And I thought, well, this isn't going to last very long. So five years later, did that project with Cyborg. Anyway, long story short, after 10 years, we decided we're going to do this thing. I'm not tugging on anybody's shirt sleeve or pant leg anymore. We're going to make the movie. So we are in the process of raising the funds. We are going to fan fund it. I don't want to say crowd fund it because you guys are not part of the crowd. You're, uh, you guys are some of the best people on the planet. So we're going to fan fund it. It's, and we changed it from centigrade to centigrade rising. And if you're so inclined, it's, look, I'm just going to appeal to you. Please go to the website, uh, centigrade.com or centigraderising.com. Go on there, check it out. There is a donate button, even if you give us a dollar, uh, or you want to get involved somehow. You guys are pretty tech savvy. Um, a few of you may have always wanted to make a movie. We bring you on as an executive producer, fly you out, make you part of the process. We, it's, we're going to make this film happen, and we're going to need help to do it. So Centigrade or Centigrade Rising, uh, go on there and check it out. But that's what's coming next. And it's one of the reasons why I'm here. I want to get the word out and let everybody know what we're doing. But at the very least, boy, you'd be so welcome on Friday at, uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, please, you had a question, sir. What was it like playing John Pope in Falling Skies? Awesome. Uh, no, it really, really was. Um, Look, also, look, when that show started, we had Bob Rodat, Robert Rodat, who did Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, and there were some, some really amazing people uh, involved in that. Of course, uh, Steven Spielberg himself. And we gave it everything we had. It was, it was tough. And I don't think we always hit the mark, but boy, we were really, we were really shooting for it. I think an unfortunate thing that happened over the, the, the show's progression is that we had, I want to say, seven different head writers in five years. Usually you'd have one. We had seven. And everybody comes in with a different vision, or let's try this, or let's try that. And so things got a little, uh, a little strange from time to time. But, but to play John Pope, who was based on an actual hero of the revolution, uh, a soldier, and it was just, it was phenomenal. What, what I loved about that show was that as much as we got our scripts every week, they gave, they offered me some latitude 
they didn't bite down on me too hard when I went off, uh, off book. And so I was able to color things a little bit more, which really gave me a, a, just a, another stake in the game. Oftentimes you've got to show up, you hit your mark, you say your lines, you don't move a comma, and that's it. Whereas, I don't know, it just brought a different something to the picture, and, it, uh, and I loved it. And Noah Wiley, to this day, is one of the most uh, generous and professional actors I have ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot. And anyway, I just I, I hold him in very high regard. And of course, Will Patton, um, he's just a thousand percent, and he just shows up, and he's ready to do it, and he's, and he's just so there. So it was just a different kind of experience. It wasn't, a lot of times you, you'll, you'll do these shows and it's a little on the cookie cutter side. You know, it's, you'll see two people in the frame and then we'll do an over the shoulder of one and we'll do a single and you can almost, you can see it. It's, it's fairly mathematical. Where Skies was, was different, man. It was, uh, it had scope and they were really, really shooting for something. So I, I just gratitude, I suppose. But man, you show up. You show up on the set and they've locked down three miles of freeway. And it's three miles as far as the eye can see. There are cars turned over, there are buses on fire, there is rubble, there is, it's, and it wasn't green screen, there's some green screen stuff, but when you show up and you see a set like that, it's staggering, it really is. And boy, do you think, how small your contribution to this show really is. Because you could put, you could put a, a, a sandbag on a stick and, and just hear the dialogue and you'd still have a story. It was what these incredible artists created that, uh, that stays with me. A lot of times you'll remember a great actor, you remember, I, I remember great set, set designers, I remember great props people. I remember great painters. How do they make that look like a rock? It's styrofoam. How do they make that look like marble? It's wood. How do they make it look like a, like a five-story building has fallen? And none of it's real. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. Yes? So I was looking at you, but because of the masks, and I'm like, yet I'm hearing the vocals coming a little lower. I'm sorry, go right in. No, no, no. So, I found you for calling Sky first. I think it's a little bit better. Thank you. Times I walk by these tables and I'm seeing the people that helped me 
make decisions like that. And it's weird, and you do, you can kind of choke up about it. You know, even though it's Bob Denver from Gilligan's Island, it's like, yeah, but they don't want to scare him, man! So it can be weird, it can be weird, but thank you, thank you very much. Can we encourage uh, questions to be on the microphone? So, oh, good idea, yeah. So, just so we can hear it, and we're recording it too, so. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Yeah. Nice pants. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, Colin, you, man, you've been everywhere throughout my life. I started out sci-fi with Star Wars with my dad introducing you to me to it as I like was six, seven years old. I go on to Sanctuary, you're in there. I go on to Andromeda, you're there. Series finale of Falling Skies, you're the reason I got the end of the show. Thank you. But my question is, out of all of those shows, which set was your favorite to work on? Out of all of the shows, what was my favorite set? Specifically the set, because I know each show has a different looking set. Which one was the coolest and most fun? Yeah, I'll only answer according to what the first thing in my head. I would say, I would say that the Stargate set was probably the most friendly, fun, warm, familial set I've ever been on. But I was too terrified to notice. I see it now, but when I showed up, I was always scared. I was terrified, truly terrified, terrified, or I'm gonna screw something up or whatever. So I would say that the, the set I think I felt most, my favorite set would either be Falling Skies or Blood Drive. Um, Falling Skies because they gave me something to do. I wasn't number nine on the call sheet. I wasn't there to feed exposition to Richard or Amanda, um, which, which is nothing wrong with that. But I was, I had, I had a bigger stake in the game, so it was nice to take a little more weight on, you know, and to be respected, let's say, within that category. Um, Blood Drive, <laughs> just a show that nobody's seen, and maybe you shouldn't. But Blood Drive, for all of its faults, and it was this uh, hodgepodge of grindhouse, gore, sex. Uh, it was it was pretty out there. It was really really out there. But it had never been done before in television history. It had never been done before. Because of that, I was able to do anything and everything I've ever wanted to do. It's, it's crazy. Here was this almost disposable show that no one was ever going to see, nobody gave a rat's ass about, and that you couldn't possibly take seriously in any way. And I attacked it like I was doing Arthur Miller. I've never worked so hard in my entire life on any one thing. So if you're curious, watch Blood Drive, what I was able to do in Blood Drive, I've never been given the freedom before, ever. Uh, James Rowland, is, uh, was, they allowed me to do so much, and for that I'm just forever grateful. Because I just wanted to see, I don't want this to sound arrogant, but I guess as an actor, I wanted to see how good can you be. And so I went to town on that insane crazy show. Yes, hello. Okay. So, um, I want to know, like, after, after all those 10 years on Stargate SG-1, did you ever expect, to, were you ever surprised at the, at the scope it, the, that show achieved around the world? Just in terms of Stargate SG-1, have I ever been surprised at the scope? Um, originally, yes, I was very surprised. I was like, what the hell's this all about? But then I realized I hadn't seen any. I worked on the show, but I hadn't watched any. And then I finally watched one. And the first one I watched, and maybe you guys can tell me, was, it was a weird, twisted episode where I want to say, uh, uh, Richard, was it Richard Dean Anderson kills, uh, 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 Daniel? It was some kind of time, weird, warp loop. I think Daniel became a god or something, and, and Richard Dean kills him. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> it was so, 
and the acting was so good. It was so good. And I thought, again, here's a sci-fi show. They jump through a star hole, and it takes you to another thing, and you have adventures on other planets. And I just saw the caliber of acting in that one episode, and I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not stupid. This is a smart, intelligent science fiction show. It's almost like just a, it was just a really good show. It just happened to be sci-fi. You can put Stargate, those writers could do a Western, they can do sci-fi, they can do a medical drama. It was just damn good writing. Yes. So, Hope was my favorite character as well, because I always really related to him as like the outcast that was only called upon when they were useful. Um, and I was honestly really disappointed with what they did in his character in the end, and I was just wondering how you felt about the ending that Hope got in Bowman's guys. Say that one more time. <laughs> No, it is a math yeah. I'm covering up. So, Hope was my favorite character. Hope was your favorite character. Because I've always related to the outcasts that were only called upon when they were useful. Um, and I was honestly a little disappointed in the ending that you got. And so I was just wondering how you felt about the ending. Uh, I will say that for me the show went from Oh my god, I get to do this. And it ended more, thank god I've got a job. You know, there, there are some parts you're just grateful to, to, to show up and work because it's so nice to work. And it doesn't matter what you do. You're an actor, you stand, oh my god, the aliens are coming, or whatever it is the dialogue is, and it's great. Uh, as opposed to, you know, working in a warehouse or driving a forklift, which I used to do as well. But then there's other shows where it's like, wow, man, you get to you have a say in things, you have a stake in things. So the first early part of Falling Skies, I had the wow, this is amazing. And towards the end, things, it, yeah, it got, it got different. And so I was just happy to be there to have a job. Um, so yeah, story-wise, yeah, I agree with you, but uh, well, I can't critically go there because I was just so grateful to simply just set foot on a film set because that's a magical place to be. They've always said it's, I'd rather have my worst day on set than a great day fishing. Yes? I think I can speak for all Stargate fans when I ask, is there any chance that you can convince MGM Studios to re-release Stargate SG-1 in a remastered form? Is there any chance I could get MGM to re-release SG-1? I didn't know it was being held back. They're making a new one, right? How are there's talk? I've just been talking forever. Uh, it's good. Um, yeah, well, I will say this. If they're doing, there's probably so many bootleg copies of SG-1. But look, there's no question. SG-1, I would say, is probably the most successful sci-fi franchise in the history of the world. Um, it is, it's unique. It's bespoke. It's amazing. And uh, I hope that it comes back. And I hope they re-release everything they they've ever done, because boy, there's a whole new generation of fans that can tap into that magic that was SG-1. Yes, sir. So my question is actually from Sanctuary. Um, what was it, the atmosphere like in filming Sanctuary, and what was it like playing Brian Robbins' uh, rival in your guest appearance? The, thank you, the, um, I will say the atmosphere was this. And maybe this is just a personal thing. The atmosphere, in many ways, has nothing to do with sanctuary. The atmosphere was F them, not the sanctuary people. Amanda, that was her, she was so behind me, that was her baby. And nobody believed in her. They didn't want to give her the part, they didn't want her attached to the show. A lot of that. Whatever that is, however that manifests itself. Yeah, yeah, you were great on Stargate, but we need someone younger, we need someone this, we need someone that, whatever they need. So the atmosphere on the show was, screw them. We're gonna do this, we're gonna make this happen, and it's going to be a success. So that was the atmosphere. At least that's the first thing that comes to mind. So everybody worked incredibly hard, because Amanda's an incredible person who also works incredibly hard. And it was about 
that. It was about, it was just about that. Ryan's a fantastic guy. Ryan and I would often go out to the same parts. Even though we're not the same, we're the same. We go out to the same parts. So everybody on that show was, uh, was fantastic. And again, another blessing. Yes? Hi. I don't really have a question. It's just I wanted to come back on your second story about when you heard yourself in German. Uh, for me today, this is the first time I hear your real voice. Yeah. I'm French. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Who, wait, who's better? German, French, or me? For real? No, for real. Like, who's got the better voice? Uh, German, I don't know. French, uh, on... Uh, I know. On Italian one. Italian one. <laughs> nice! The Italian major genders is the best major genders. Yeah, but in Stargate and from this guy, you've got two different voices. Wow. So completely different, but... Your, your That's, so great. That's so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think this is our last question. All right, so I, uh, when I sat down, I started looking through my gay con photos, you know, memory lane, all that stuff, and I came across a video of you playing the saxophone. Can you tell us about your musical side as well? Yeah, my musical side. I suck. <laughs> no, I swear to God. I, I just took up the saxophone like six years ago, okay? <laughs> It's a horrible instrument. Don't ever pick one up. No, like a piano, you can ding, ding, ding. You can sit on a piano and get sound out of it. A saxophone is a living hell. It's like trying to wrestle an alligator that does not want to be held. It's terrible. There's reeds and mouthpieces and necks, and every hole's got to be perfect. Your posture, your armature, your clubs. It's terrible. So, what I've learned the most playing saxophone is a song called Humility. Because I low, in a very real sense, so it's really hard to learn, and then you got to play with other people, and you suck, and it's like, wow, isn't that Major Davis? Yeah, he sucks. He can't play saxophone at all, but you keep doing it, you keep showing up, keep sucking, don't stop sucking until you become okay, and then average, and then maybe pretty good, you don't give up, you don't quit, um, and so you don't quit. Let's leave it on that. That note, thank you all so very, very much. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Hey, who's, who's next? Who's coming up next? I'm just curious, like, four people came in, I'm thinking, well, they're not here.